Ja, ganz herzlich willkommen und guten Morgen. Ich bin Stefanie Rosenthal, Direktorin des Hauses. I send you a very warm welcome for the press view. Um, and I also want to welcome these two amazing women who are sharing the stage with me today, Ottobong Nakanga and Clara Meister, who curated the exhibition with me. It's the press view of the exhibition, There's No Such Thing as Solid Ground. Hören Sie mich alle so okay? Ist das so in Ordnung? Durch das mufflige Maske. Bisschen näher, ist es so besser? Zu laut? Besser so? Okay, gut. Also ich halte es. I have to hold it very close. So you, you. Yeah, it's an exhibition which we, it feels like we worked on for a very long time, but I think it feels like it because Otto Wong de Kanga was the artist in residence here at the Gropius Bau in 2019. And we actually had the pleasure to have a close connection with her from much earlier on. Ottobon already agreed in 2017, that was when I appointed as a new director to come and be with us for a year. And the invitation was very closely to re related to a work she did at Documenta. And we wanted to bring that and explore that further here at the Gropius Bau. And at the same time, we decided to do a solo exhibition. It's an exhibition which really touches on all, I think, important aspects of her work, but it's not an overview. It's not like a large scale retrospective of Otto Bong Nikanga's work because we would need even more space than the eight rooms we're having. Otto Bong Nikanga is war für uns von Anfang an interessant, weil sie sich mit Themen beschäftigt, die für den Gropiusbau und das Programm des Gropiusbaus sehr wichtig sind. Und vielleicht erinnern sich einige von Ihnen, dass wir ja als allererste Ausstellung in 2018 auch eine Ausstellung mit Anna Mendiata hatten und dann mit Libul. Und es sind Themen, die relevant sind, weil wir der Meinung sind, dass diese Frage Verbindung zwischen Körper und Land, aber Land verstanden als Erde, Grund, also die Frage nach Ownership, wem gehört was, wo fühlen wir uns zu Hause, unserer Meinung nach Themen und Fragen sind, die in unserer Zeit besonders relevant sind. Und wir uns deshalb mit Künstlerinnen beschäftigen, die sich diese Frage auch stellen. Und ähm, ich denke, dass Otto Bong de Kanga eine Künstlerin ist, die das von Anfang an getan hat. Und I'm, I'm always tempted to say you started with performances, which is not really true, because you did drawings. And, but you, for the ones you have seen the exhibition, I think it's, it's very exceptional how Otto Bong thinks land, nature, environment, together with the body. And I've never worked with an artist who I feel it's, it's lived in every work. And it's lived in her performances, her drawings, the way how there is a nearly, I mean, obviously a very conceptual connection in the, in the phys philosophical and theoretical, but also a real physical, intuitive connection between the body, her body, but also the, the body of everybody and what and the connection to land. And I think the, the question around exploitation is related to the land, but it's also always related to the body. And I think I really learned through her what for us is that importance of, of, of always looking where is this connection between body and land? Because it, it, it feels like the, the, the taking away something from someone relates to the land, how we treat our environment, but also how we treat our bodies or the bodies of other people. So for me, really a key aspect of this exhibition is um, a lot the thinking around breathing and how you talk about breathing. And that is a theme or, or kind of an, I think an exploration you have somehow always dealt with in, in, in different ways. Um, diese Frage des Einatmens können und dürfen und wo können wir das und wer gibt uns die Erlaubnis zu leben, weil Atmen ist Leben. Und ich finde, dass das in Ihren Arbeiten jetzt gerade in, in der Ausstellung wieder klar wird, wie präzise Sie sich mit diesen Dingen auseinandersetzt. Um, another aspect which is, is a core 
And I think that's also my first question, because Clara and myself, we will have a conversation with Otto Wong instead of um, giving a longer introduction. The first, um, I think, yeah, aspect I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm curious today is what we've talked about from the beginning on this, this care. So in, in, I think in English it's maybe slightly easier. In German it's Sorge für oder Fürsorge. Sich Sorgen um, um jemanden und um, Fürsorge. And I think in, in Ottobo's work is a work which is deeply caring. I mean, Ottobo is someone who cares also for people she works with, which we were able to experience in the last two years, um, that she really truly lives this idea. But in her work, in the conceptual and also the physical exploration of her work, I think care and the interest in care is, seems to be a driving force. Um, and now, Otto Wong, I think you, you can decide if you talk about specific works or if you want to more talk about it in an in a overarching um, kind of way, if, if, um, what's the driving force for you? Well, um, thanks, Stephanie, and thanks, everyone, for being here. Can you hear me? Is it very clear? Okay, I will talk slowly and pronounce my words precisely so that you can hear it, because this thing is quite tough. Um, so I'd like to thank uh, Grippus Bau and also thank the team, and the team is a large team, um, that have been working on this exhibition, that have been working with me for the past uh, two years here. Um, all the technical teams that we don't mention, Thomas is here today, he's right behind. Hi, Thomas. <laughs> and um, all the ladies that will be taking care of the performance uh, program, and also Nuno, who will be in the space of Path to Flow for at least three months here as an architect in-house. Um, and Clara, Stephanie, um, Annie, uh, in short, I need to just thank everybody before I start. Because without them, it would have been very difficult to be able to do the things we do within a structure that is beyond the house. Um, which is beyond the Gropus Bow. Um, so with that, I think the way we were thinking about the exhibition started with many ideas. Um, and slowly, one had to think, how do we work and how do we think about the people working within an institution and what kind of energy can be expensed for ideas we have as artists? And so for me, it was a very important thing to be able to decide on, or we decided together on the works in relation to the energy that can be expensed and the energy that can be given to the works. And that was a way of also thinking through the exhibition. Um, so finally, we've, we're showing different works from different times. So the oldest works starts with, um, from 1997 with drawings that I made um, when I was in Nigeria, Ife, to the most recent wall drawing, which just got finished today at um, 8.36 this morning. Um, so we'll have a wide range of works. Um, there are works that have never been shown here within the European, um, not it was shown in England, but not on the other side of Europe. Um, and that work is Manifest of Strains, which was made in 2018. But I think last year, when we, I was doing the residency, um, we had a lot of discussions with Stephanie around what does it mean to, because we talk a lot about ex exploitation, and we cannot talk about exploitation without talking about care, we can't talk about exploitation without talking about repair, but a lot of times taking something out of somewhere seems much easier than trying to replenish it. And, and a lot of times we forget that aspect of how do we put something back that we have taken from somewhere. 
And so for the project that I worked on, or we worked on last year with regards to the residency, which is the carved to flow project that I did in 2017 in Documenta Athens and in Castle, and now it's, um, it's expanded in different ways. We, the project has opened, a, or Carve to Flow has opened a space in Athens, an art space, and a space to do projects and um, explore ideas, and also a foundation in Nigeria. So from the money of the soaps, that has gone back into places that have given me knowledge, that has also given me the possibility to exist in this world. And so it's a way of thinking, if I take so much oil from a place, how do you put back something of a different value, but it's still a value in the place that you take it out? We always think of exploitation as something that is just maybe minerals, material-based, but I also think of it in ways in which certain things are taken from someone without having to reference the place that you've taken from. So it could be a conversation where someone gives me an idea and I go along with it and make it seem like it's mine. And that is an extractive process. And so for me, it's very important to think how are we relating to ways in which we take, ways in which we use, and in ways in which we leave the other side um, obscure. Um, so I think these were a lot of the discussions we had also last year with Stephanie and also with Clara on how can we think of ways of caring for something, ways in which if we're using something, what are the residues or the ruins or the remains that remain from that? And how do you work at the same time to repair as you take? And so the way of conceiving the exhibition was around those topics, but also that the project downstairs in floor zero with Carve to Flow continues the ways in which Carve to Flow project works, where one can come in to really work around soil to think about what do we stand on? What is the most, one of the most precious things on this planet, which is the soil we use? And if that soil degrades more and more than our crops, we won't be able to eat. Well, everything is affected. And to think through having a material that is so common everywhere around us, but what does it mean to work with it, to build with it, to live with it? Um, and um, yeah, so I think I will, yeah, I kind of give an overview of what the thinking process was for the exhibition. So I don't know if you have more questions, so yeah. So maybe um, we can pick up on this idea of soil and the, f the, the ground we stand on. So when you visit the exhibition, the very first space, we encounter the site-specific installation Taste of a Stone. Um, a landscape really, or an indoor garden of gravels and rocks and plants. So I was wondering if you could introduce to all of us the, the installation and what we can maybe learn from these rocks and stones and plants and how it evolves. Um, so Taste of a Stone is a work that has been evolving since 2010. The first time I made this work was in an exhibition called Make Yourself at Home. So it was already a thinking process of how can you create a space that could be a place of contemplation, a place of rest, a place to reflect, and also a place to um, perform or to act with the elements there. One of the things I really enjoy in making work is to allow, create works that could allow a, a visitor to engage with, not just looking at it, um, because we, most of the times we're working a lot with our senses, but a lot of times we're using mainly our eyes. And um, so in this installation, which is filled with white pebbles, and rocks that have been taken from the surrounding of Berlin, and plants that are endemic to Europe 
and Northern Europe, um, was to give a place where people can touch and taste what this material is. So the idea of reframing or framing something tightly so that you can engage with it and you focus on it very precisely allows us to maybe, and I hope, think beyond what we do every day. So we can pass by a rock, but we never kind of think about it. We never have time to really sit down, caress it, feel its coldness, look at the veins that are in between the materials. And here it's a place that can allow you to do that, to think through that. But I'm always interested in materials like rocks, stones, minerals, um, water, very materials that are very close to what we see every day, what we use. But what I'm interested in is in its composite, in its way that it can allow for granite to be next to a mica, next to another mineral that normally don't stick together. And the place of, so I use those materials to think about the place of the fusion or the place of cohabitation or the place of um, where specific elements start having um, an energy or let's say a kind of vibration or, or tone. And from this very little things and spending time with them, those have been the places where I've been able to think through all the works or a lot of the works that you will see through the show. So Taste of a Stone is one of the center works. As you come in, that's what you see. And you can, it will stain your body also, so your shoes will have some residues. You will take traces of it into the space. Um, but it's a place where we are also trying to invite people to react or start, have that place as a starting point to talk about the material itself or to perform. So we're going to have people during the course of the exhibition that will be engaged with that space. And I think to add that that's the work you, when we started for the first time about the floor plan and which works we want to show and where we would like to show them, Ottobon knew right away that Taste of a Stone has to be in, in our Schliemann Saal. And I think when you've seen it or you will see it, the colors, is, it's just quite astonishing how it feels that that work just can only exist in this space and how also by the way how you pick the colors for the floor it really is is, is grown in 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 this building in the gopios bow and um as you can imagine we had lots of other ideas of what could be where what each time we came back to no no taste of a stone just has to be in this central space so there's also that connection to maybe Heinrich Schliemann idea of archaeology, of an archive, of, of history. There's a lot of other layers in it now which seem to be naturally yeah, embedded in, in this work now. Um, in, in your work you talk a lot about different stages of the world, of material, how they can change, that there's no, or that there might be no, you know, final status or state. And that is, is in the material, but it's very much also, I think, expressed through sound, like the water, water dripping on a very hot plate and making shh, mm. or the kind of um, that, you know, not being able to breathe and that sudden release, which is the more kind of violent sound which comes from Manifest of Strains. Um, and we, in a way, quite late in the day, decided that we want to focus on sound and voice because it's so present in her work anyway, but there wasn't really an exhibition who was putting that in the center. So um, Otto Wong decided to do a new work for, or kind of reiteration or transformation of a, of a work, Wetting You Go Do, which became Wetting You Go Do Unaya um, for the Gropius Bau. And, um, the first work I've seen of yours was actually in the Chargera Biennale, not the last one, but I must have been seven years ago, where Ottomong was performing by herself, and her voice is just, I mean, you, now you have it all over the exhibition, but it's a 
joy to listen to. And when you did the artist in residency here, we always knew Ottobong is here because she would just suddenly start singing. So it's really part of her practice. Whatever you do, the singing is, is a part. And the wedding you go do is, is um, I was so surprised to learn that it's all your voices because there's so many different um, expressions, emotions, um, states. Um, so maybe you could talk a bit about how you put this work together and because and, it's nearly like an archive of voices and sounds, um, which is the base from it. Um, yeah, so the, the idea of voice for me has been very important in my life because as kids, the way we had to um, go through uh, like power cuts when we had power cuts in Nigeria at home um, was having candles in the house and we would sing. My mom used to sing and my mom used to compose even um, songs. So we would hear her in the room saying, do, 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 re, mi, fa, so, do, do. And then she'll be writing all the keys and notes and all that. And so we've always been surrounded by music and also singing. And also since we, we used to go to church, we were in the choir. So the training has been from childhood. And since my mom was also very, someone that made us work a lot, she was very disciplined, um, we would work and sing. So with working and singing, time flies. You don't even realize that you've worked for 12 hours. So by three o'clock in the morning, you're like, oh, it's three. And I always have that feeling when I'm working because I just sing or I have music and stuff like that. But for example, for the work waiting you go do, I had this idea of, okay, it came from 2015, 2016, this period of many voices. So that's the time where I felt like with the political situation that was going on in the world, you would read comments on social media and you would read so many comments on just one specific topic and you'll be able to have a range of voices having opinions about a specific little thing. And those opinions can go from a certain violence to a certain kind of acceptation to happiness. So you're reading different tones of emotions and, and also from coming from different parts of the world, people see things from multiple perspective. So I was thinking it would be interesting to be able to make a work that could have could think around that emotion of anger, love, um, drunkenness, numbness, um, and be able to put a character around a concrete ball. And that concrete ball would be the thing that is so weighty and so heavy. So it's talking about, in a certain way, weights, weights of emotions, weights of looking at the world and having an opinion but the cacophony of voices that become sometimes overwhelming and sometimes singular. And for me, it was interesting to think, how do you transmit and make a work that can allow all these emotions to play at the same time and that can transperse the skin to enter into the place where you feel? And so, this work was actually recorded here in Berlin in a studio, and I didn't script the text, but before then I really read a lot of things. And I know that when I'm reading comments on social media, I take the voices of people. So if you're German, I try to have a German accent. Or when I'm reading it, I will have a German accent, or a Dutch accent, or a Hausa accent, Ibo, Ibibio. And so, I noticed that I would be reading people's comments with accents, like, hey, now nah, what are you doing here? Or, hello, <laughs> or, you know, if it's a woman, a man, oh, come on, get out of here. So I had this kind of, I read comments in those kind of ways. So I decided that I would do this performance for three days, um, every day from six to 12 midnight, and I will not stop. So I had the mic and I would work and create voices. The first day, I would create the first voices 
The second day I layered, the third day I would even layer more. So by the end of the day, I had like over 18 hours of material, which was then well, worked together with Contemporary Sounds, a friend of mine, and he and I, we worked together in putting to the, uh, the engineering of the sound and the composition of the sound. So what you will hear are from the little sounds to the every single sound is from the voice, but it can imitate like stone or imitate um, a, and then there are also clappings and knocking on things. Um, but it's ranging, it's putting us in the range of an emotion, of a time, of where things are so um, complex, but at the same time so simple. And the question the work asks is, what are you going to do? And in broken English in Nigeria, we say, waiting you go do. And here I added, oh yeah now, which means something like, okay, come on, what's up? So uh, another choir, we could say, you uh, assemble in the project Have to Flow, which we touched upon during the conversations. Um, so during your exhibition, we show a continuation of Have to Flow germination, which has started here in 2019. And it also assembles different voices around you. It's, it's um, not this classical artwork as a closed or finished object as many of your works are. Um, so now we can encounter on the ground floor this workshop really, looks like a workshop. Yesterday somebody said it's like, lo even looks like a school, which I also thought is a nice aspect, this idea of learning in it. And Nuno Vasconcelos will be there um, during the week and really work and research with the soils of Berlin and um, soils that maybe would have been declared as waste. So um, I was wondering if you could introduce Calf to Flow, which is so complex, but maybe these three stages and what we do now here and which has started in 2017 during Documenta 14. Okay, um, yeah, Calf to Flow. <laughs> um, I think how my idea of an artwork, or the, I would call it an ultimate artwork for me, or is a work that can collapse and grow and shift its position wherever it is, and can work with the localities of where it is, and can be a sculpture, it can be everything. So that has been something I've been thinking about for years. And one of the works that have touched me in my life would be the work of Rick Lowe in Houston. And that, was, uh, that is a work called Project Row Houses. Um, and other projects that I've seen in Nigeria, Ilay Fair, uh, that deal with really the landscape, really the politics, the social aspects, the economic aspects of a place. And so, Carve to Flow, most people think of it as the soap project, and people say, oh, you do the soap. But for me, it's actually a work coming from architecture and looking at ways to create support systems within its own self and how it can support other structures or create structures that can support and care for people, for places, for land, for material. And so with that, in 2017, when I was invited to Documenta, uh, I thought it's the best place to be able to make a work that doesn't end with documenta, but that can have a life for a lifetime and maybe be handed over to other people over time. So the soap was actually the channel by which the possibility of creating an economy, but from the first place was to think about where are the places of economy or how do we think of each region in the world 
And how has it become a kind of monoculture or mono economy that produces something specific from that region to another, for another part of the world? And so if we think about places of colonization and you know, a lot of it came into being by also creating a specific kind of economy that that place will have to produce for the world. And if we think of Mediterranean belt or the areas around the southern parts of Europe, we also see that oil becomes one of the most important productions and exportations of these places. So it made sense since I was in Athens to be able to work with the oils that connect all the regions that I was thinking of, Middle East, um, the Mediterranean belt area, Southern Europe, North Africa and West Africa, and to create the soaps from that oil, but also to create a soap that would have the charcoal. Um, and thinking of charcoal is also, when you make charcoal is to create, um, to, do, to burn organic matter in absence of oxygen. And from oxygen, it made me think about what is it to breathe? So when you cannot breathe in a place, what do you do? You leave it. And so when we're thinking of migratory routes, people moving from one place to another, it's the, the core of it is to think how come one cannot breathe in that space that they live in. So if we start looking at Europe as the place of where you can breathe, where you feel that there's the possibility to actually um, uh, have oxygen to work in, then you start understanding what the aftermath of all the different kinds of, um, from colonialism to exploitation of resources on all the different, or from financial crisis to environmental crisis, we start understanding why people move and flee from a place. So it made sense to think of a work that not only thinks about that, but how can it replenish from places that it takes from. So in Castle, it made sense, in Athens, we made a lab where we made the, the first parts of the work, did workshops with people. The second part was the distribution and sales in Documenta. Since it's a large platform, to use that platform as a way that it will allow for thinking, people had to first have a conversation before they buy the soap. The third phase is the most, for me, the most interesting and more the more complex part of the project, which the money then it changes from the economy of oils, soils, soap into cash, cash into non-tangible economies. And we've opened the space in Athens, as I mentioned, Aquaibum, which is a place of non-tangible knowledge, you know, economy, because you touch people, but you don't know how much you've touched them or how much you're, you're doing or how much you're affecting. You only see that in the long run. As a foundation in Nigeria, we have land to be able to think about how, what kind of plants we'll be planting that will be related to skin care, related to care, related to thinking of ways of rethinking materials that are locally based and connected to that area. And it's been, I mean, Capture Flow has been a school in Senegal. It's been a fellowship in Utrecht. It's been um, now a fellowship here. And next year, we're thinking more of like a curriculum for uh, a university of for an art school, of a thinking, way of thinking process within arts and for younger generations. And here, it's also now a workshop. So, and in Nigeria, it's really more, very much more a philanthropic. So now with the COVID situation, we're working a lot with the local um, older women and pro providing um, food stuff for them and masks for the trainers or people that go into specific areas. So what is interesting about the project is that it has a place that it's visible and, and the locality, it, it's visible within that locality, but it doesn't have to slip into the art world. It can come in and out. It can be an enterprise. It can be multiple things that it, it wants to be. Um, and it still works within and very strongly within the art um, institutions and art spaces.
Thank you, Otto Bonk. Und deswegen ist es auch wichtig für uns, dass Carve to Flow der Raum eben unten ist. Das nochmal, Otto Bonk hat das ja am Anfang erwähnt, dass das sozusagen Teil der Ausstellung ist und nicht Teil der Ausstellung ist. So wie das eben auch Otto Bonk in ihrer Kunst wirklich äh, ganz klar immer wieder formuliert, dass Carve to Flow ein Aspekt ihrer Arbeit ist, der auch losgelöst von ihr funktioniert, sehr stark in Kooperation mit anderen Personen. Dass das wirklich sozusagen ein auch von der Kunstwelt losgelöste Struktur ist, die dazu dient, für sich selber, aber auch für andere Möglichkeiten zu schaffen, ähm, sich selbst sozusagen finanzierende Strukturen zu realisieren. Und das war eben auch was, was für uns hier als Institution wichtig war, immer wieder zu überlegen, wie können wir eigentlich auch unabhängig sein. Und für Otto Wong sozusagen ganz wichtig, immer wieder diese unabhängig auch von privatem und öffentlichem Geld, dass man sagt, dieses System Carve to Flow finanziert sich eben auch selbst und finanziert die Foundation Nigeria, ein Projektraum in Athen, ist sozusagen eher eine Schule und ein Miteinander und Voneinander lernen. Und so hat sie eben hier entschieden, dass mit Nuno Vasconcelos es ein Workshop ist, wo man eben mit sozusagen Erde hier in Berlin lernen, Ziegelsteine zu bauen und auch langfristig sozusagen sich überlegt, wie kann man nachhaltige Architekturen bilden. Und deswegen sozusagen ist das eigentlich ein losgelöstes Projekt und als solches behandeln wir es auch immer wieder, weil es eben für Otto Bong Kanga auch eigentlich ein losgelöstes Projekt ist. Ähm, wir dachten eigentlich, dass wir es in dem Moment auch öffnen. Ähm, we're opening it up. Uh, falls Sie, if you have questions for Otto Bong or in relation to the exhibition, then we would have a moment to do this now. Wie machen wir das mit Mikrofonen? Ah, da. The, the question was that your stay in Berlin was very much influenced by coronavirus and that if that has any impact or kind of expression in the work. Besides, we have to say the artist in residency was 2019. So it influenced her, like how she installed, but it doesn't, it didn't influence the residency. Well, I, th I think the, the process of thinking around things that corrupt or things that, um, how do you say, in quite a number of the works you also see here, um, where you see water or something infiltrating into something, um, or the work that I did in Venice with the veins and the kind of um, corruption or something that kind of seeps through that is almost invisible, or the m shifting states with elements that are, um, changing from one state to another and rendered visible. I mean, it's not about corona or not corona, but when we went through the crisis in West Africa with Ebola, and my family live in Nigeria and we had also a case there, um, we see that in some parts of the world, or when I was in China last few years, when there was also the SARS and the MERS, the thing is that here we do not realize that there are other parts of the world that are already going through these kinds of crises. Um, and even when I was in China, you had to wear a mask. So I'm used to wearing the mask. I can wear a mask for 20 hours and it doesn't bother me. Or when I was in Bangladesh this year, where there's a lot of pollution in the air and where you see the effects on people's bodies. And when you go out on the street, you immediately have to wear a mask. So it's not even about Corona, it's just about how breathable is the place you live in. Um, some places are already going through that, what we are now facing here in an extreme way. So it's not only the moment that you can take off the mask and say, oh, finally I can breathe. But when you take off the mask, you still cannot breathe. Um, so when you've been in places and you have family and friends that in places that are going through extreme shifts and extreme um, um, crisis like this, and you see the body. I have many of my friends that have died from cancer, just 
because they live in a place that every morning they have to clean their house maybe six, seven times to get rid of the smut, and it never goes. So when you're thinking like that, I think for me it's something that has always followed the way of thinking, because even as kids, we lived near a cement factory in Shagamu, where we got all started having asthma. So you realize that it becomes part of the way you're thinking, because every day you hear stories, you're in places, your family are in places that there is no choice, it's not over, it's never over. So at this point in time, we are here and we say, oh my God, when is this going to be over? And we have that luxury to think that we have that possibility for it to be over. And so it's not about when or if it affected, it's continuous. Die Dame in Rot und dann... I think a lot of things that I've learned from my mother haven't, or from my family hasn't come through, um, have come through a combination of things. So I wouldn't separate the care, repair, storytelling, narratives, material as separate things. Listening to a sound and hitting it, my mother might hit something and she'll say, you know, if you hit that, this will happen. But it's not about the hitting, what she hits. It's the sound that it made that has an impact on me. Then, from there, I can connect it to what she says. And then, each time I see something hit, it brings me back to that place. And I can continue that story to the next generation and the next generation. So the impact of multiple layers of things can allow you to understand what it means to hit something and make a dent. And then after that, what it means to be able to take that dent and kind of find ways of, you can't repair it totally, but find ways of making it much more bearable. And I will talk about bearable because the idea of even repairing sometimes is quite hard once you've already made that. But you can make something much more livable, much more bearable. Um, you can never bring it back to its pristine state, but you can alter it for it to become something that we can live with. And storytelling, I think, as coming from an African background where a lot of the things that are transmitted to us are through stories, through narratives, through um, sitting down and just listening. And you, we talked about the moment of just singing together with the family. And in between, a story will erupt. So the, the possibility of healing at the same time, because while listening to that music or listening to the sound of a voice that is very soothing, you're also healing within that a mental state, an emotional state. But at the same time, you could tell a story that hits really to the point, that touches a precise part of the cortex, of the heart, of the skin. So it's not, so for me, it's all those different kinds of layers that one can understand what it means, the narrative, storytelling, the care, the bearability of something or the livability of something and the repair of something. And all that works together as a connected string. 
I don't know if I answered your question. Thanks. It's often a bad paid work and oh yeah 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 shut up okay depends there are many there are many questions you ask there <laughs> in a way we are made to bring life into the world as women. And the idea of bringing life into the world forces us in a way and puts us in the position to be able to care for another being and to take care of another being. I don't see it as something negative or as something I accept that role as a woman, if I have a kid, that I'll take care of it, and it's a part of me, and it's like an extension of me. I think it's a, um, it's, the thing is, how do we train the ones that we take care of and bring into this world to understand that it's not only the job of a woman, but if you have a son or you have a daughter, how do you make the masculine and the feminine side of that person be at a heightened level of understanding what it means to be in this world is not to be oppressing the other, but to be in sync and in, in how do you say, partnership with the other. And so I think it's a lot of like a chain of different things that comes with a shift in the way of the education that we have put and the ways that we've demarcated and, and designed gender. And with that, I know of men and that have those sensibilities and sensitivities. But of course, in our ways of the structure, in every the institutional structure, the kind of, from the top to the bottom, has been tainted by this idea of what, who or what should be caring. And with that kind of care, the kind of money or the kind of economy that goes with that. So since it's not seen as a job that is dealing with this part, the intellect, the Apollonian side, but much more Dionysian, something that is much more embodied with blood, with sweat and it's not it's the same way that we will also put people that are working in factories laborers their works that do not have to that are not paid well because they don't seem to um, look like they're using an intellect they they seem to be much more physical manual um, emotional and that is something that has been designed in a way to make it that you will never be paid enough for that work that you do. Um, and I, I call it a design because it is a design. Um, I know of men that can do that job and care, but the design has been designed for men for a certain kind of masculinity, let's say. I, 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 for me, it's not a, I mean, the market for African or not African, it's not, uh, I'm more interested in how are we creating forms to be able to think beyond the market. We've seen in the crisis what the market does, and I'm not interested in that story of if I'm waiting for the market to do something. 
are more interested, and of course, coming from places that um, it's not that easy to be able to make work, show work, whatever. I think a lot of people are extremely creative. So if we're only thinking of, I don't know which market we're talking about, but whatever the market is, I've seen many people in places that forces them to be creative about how to create an economy, how to generate funds. And that economy is not only about money, but having force, that means people, a group of people together, which is beyond even an economy. Because when we see how the economy has been, the thing that has kept people together wasn't the money, precise, uh, uh, only the money. It was because there were groups of people that could generate farmers, different kinds of people that could generate ways that in the end you didn't see the cash flow, but you saw people giving and battering for things. So I think it's another way to think that we cannot just depend on the economy that is from above, but we have to spread it in another direction to be able to survive multiple blows of crises that we will be having in the future. So for me, it's not, I'm not looking at that aspect as a place to, to, or to worry about Africa. We've been existing as Africans for a long time with the blows and the crises that have been going on, and we're still doing, making, inventing, and creating. And for me, that's the place I look at. Maybe the last question, if there is one. How you like Berlin? Oh, Berlin, I, I know Berlin. <laughs> I've been in Berlin um, in 2013 and 14. Um, also at the uh, residency at the DAAD. Um, it's a city that allows, that can, it's very conducive to work in. What I love about Berlin in relation to where I live, which is Antwerp, is the amount of green. Uh, it's amazing. Everywhere you turn, it's green. Okay, now they're building new buildings, but even before it was even greener. And for me, having this kind of oxygen in the air, I think allows for the possibility to work. The amount of plants giving out uh, the oxygen the chlorophyll, you know, the, the, all that is, and when you're walking, you can look at things and feel at peace in a certain way. So it's a place that does that. And, and also it has the possibility of being able to see art, meet people, many people from many places, many groups of people that you can eat, you know, you can, yeah, I love it, but um, it's, I never wanted to stay in it, though. Um, because I feel that it could also make you feel a bit complacent, uh, quite easy going. Easy going. Um, so I like places that are a bit more under tension, a bit more... Um, but I like places like this in between. I can live one or two years. Mm. Yeah, thank you very much for yeah. um, coming here, joining us. A big thank you again to Ottobong thank to you. give all the energy in this show, to Clara Meister who worked with us on it and produced this wonderful booklet. Um, which also yes. has new poems by Ottobong in it, a text by Robert Maharaj. So a very nice publication we've done this time mm. for Ottobong de Kanga. I also would like to thank again Nuno Vasconcelos yeah. for working and collaborating on Carve to Flow, Contemporary Sounds for working here with Ottobong on Wetting You Go Do, all the lenders, of course, and especially Katharina Heise, mm. who's the project manager of that exhibition and the whole team of the Gropiusbau. 
Annie Geising and her team for organizing all the fantastic communication and doing a press conference under this kind of new circumstances for all of us. Hauptstadt Kulturfonds, who supported your show heavily, Flemish community, and the federal government commissioner for culture and media, Monika Grütters, for helping us to do this show. Thank you very much, and I wish you all a very nice day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.